Welcome to Money Matters. I'm Emily Johnson, Certified Financial Planner and Managing Director of Polaris Capital Advisors. So the news this week, the financial news this week, has been drenched in the talk of the, fin the pending fiscal cliff and politics, of course. So you've heard plenty of commentary on the possibility of tax hikes for all Americans or possibly for those earning only $250,000 or more. You've heard about cutting government spending, about changing the tax code, all of these really exciting things. And basically this discussion can just become extremely mind-numbing. Um, also, watching the markets. If you're somebody that watches the markets every day, you're watching them ebb and flow on a daily basis, and it can be equally as mind-numbing. And what's sort of interesting is that typically markets look forward about six months, so you don't see quite as much volatility. But the markets today are really moving more or less based on daily news, on what's happening from an hour-to-hour -hour, uh, perspective. And that can also be extremely nerve-wracking. So, you know, all of this, and you're combining all of this news and all of this sort of mind-numbing information, um, all of this detail, with the fact that we are headed directly into the holidays, which can equally, you know, be equally as stressful, um, you know, on the home front. So the thing I'd like to focus this show on is removing some of this uncertainty that this fiscal cliff is causing and refocusing on some really basic financial facts. Number one, and that is that regardless of whether a deal is struck or not, and it's appearing more and more that a deal likely will be struck of some sort, that these changes, these fiscal cliff changes, the taxes, the spending, et cetera, they're going to take place gradually, and you will have time to absorb them into your life and into your investments if they impact your life and your investments at all. Um, and number two, the second financial fact, is that regardless of what happens January the 1st, December 31st, your financial focus needs to remain on the core tenets of financial planning. And we're going to discuss those in more detail um, throughout the show, but basically those core tenets, having a rainy day fund, assessing your liabilities, reviewing your savings plan and investments, and just managing your overall risk. So throughout the remainder of this show, and I'll be joined by shortly by David Kroll of the Mortgage Network, we'd like to discuss these facts and the reality of the so-called cliff and the steps that you can take to hopefully reduce the impact should this cliff come about, if some of the aspects of this cliff come about, reduce the impact of those elements on your personal financial plan. So please stick with us. We'll be right back. We'll be joined by David Kroll in just a moment. I'm Emily Johnson. Join us back here in just a minute. Welcome back to Money Matters. I'm joined today by David Kroll of Mortgage Network. And David, I wanted to talk with you about some of the things that I was just addressing in the opening. First and foremost, that this cliff that everybody is talking about really is not necessarily going to be a cliff, so to speak. I mean, yes, if we go over uh, you know, into January, several things could happen, but they're not going to happen immediately. So this fear is somewhat unwarranted. Can you talk to me a little bit about how you see that with your clients that come in uh, you know, talking about their financial situations? Absolutely. Um, the, the, the use of the word cliff uh, and the, the pickup in the, in the press and, and on TV and so forth uh, really uh, is, is evocative of an event, of, uh, of literally a, a sort of Thelma and Louise mm -hmm. event <laughs> where, where there really is a cliff and there really is a they moment. They said that they hold hands when they go they, over the cliff. And they're happy. So. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the national economy has no such cliff. In other words, the, the, the day after January 1st is, is really the same as as the day before January 1st. Mm -hmm. The economy rolls on. Um, we still wake up. We still wake up. Still go to uh, work. We still do business. <laughs> um, we still write mortgages. Uh, there will be no cataclysmic change. Uh, it just doesn't happen that way. Uh, the same cliff, uh, the, the same kind of cataclysm was predicted uh, uh, as a result of the election. The election came and went. There was no palpable difference. Stock market went down a little bit because of uh, uh, chitter chatter immediately about the the, the fiscal cliff. Mm -hmm. Fiscal cliff is is really not going to change much of anything. Right. Although you have to admit that I mean immediately after I mean we have to sort of separate a few things here. We're talking about the market. Uh, you know, since we're, this is an investment type show, so we have the market. Whether you're talking about the stock market or the bond market, and then you have the broader economy. Mm -hmm. So you know when we talk about 
uh, going over the cliff, what it could do to the stock market and the bond market, if you want to equate that to what happened after the election, we certainly did see a decline immediately following the election based on the assumption that we could go over this fiscal cliff, that there's not going to be any hand-holding, mm -hmm. there's not going to be happiness in Washington, and mm -hmm. there's not going to be agreement, so therefore the stock market went down. To your point, though, regardless of what happens with the ebb and flow of the stock market, it's the economy that's really driving the train. Exactly. And, so, and, that's, and, and I'm, uh, thank you so much for making that distinction. It's the economy that drives the train. No matter what we all talk about, no matter what political party we're in, no matter what show we listen to mm -hmm. last, no matter what the stock market happens to be saying on a given day, mm -hmm. um, the economy has an overwhelming effect. If the economy grows even incrementally and slowly over the next 24 months, mm -hmm. uh, uh, many of the issues that, are, that we're confronting in, 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 in terms of taxing and spending evaporate. Curiously though, I know interest rates are your game. Yes. You know, in the mortgage mm -hmm. markets, so interest rates are your game. So as you're seeing uh, you know, this wrangling going on in Washington, t talk to me about what you're seeing happening with long-term interest rates and then also when you see that there could be a consensus, you know, when there's sort of this, oh my gosh, maybe they are going to agree on something, what's happening with rates then? Because I know what happens in the stock market, but I don't necessarily see it every day, you know, in the movement in interest rates and you see it every day. I see it every day, but it, it also affects your market because mm -hmm. it, uh, half of what you do is the bond market. Right. So it's, uh, it's very interesting. There's a, a Greek myth uh, uh, called the myth of Sisyphus. And Sisyphus was the uh, giant strong man who was rolling the rock up the hill. And he only, got his, he only got about three quarters of the way up the hill, and he couldn't push it any further. However, he couldn't relax because the rock would roll back and crush him. Mm -hmm. So he was destined to, in eternity, be stuck on pushing the hill, the pushing the rock, yeah. not able to go forward, not able to go backward. Mm -hmm. That's exactly where interest rates are because of our, uh, the action by the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. Federal Reserve is pumping $60 billion a month into stabilizing interest rates, but it my, can't push any further. It's my understanding that of that money that the Fed is putting into, uh, into circulation, that it is actually the Treasury that's buying the bulk of it because they're using those funds to finance the United States government. So while the right hand is putting the money out there, the left hand is taking it back, it's not necessarily in circulation for you and I and reducing our uh, you know, cost of living in any way or improving our lifestyle. It's, it is not at all. It's improving the debt burden of the United States government. So what's the motivation for the, for the Fed to, you know, to stop doing that if, if they have a ready buyer in itself in the, in the U.S. Treasury? The, there's no motivation. Uh, however, uh, the Fed's expressed intent, a uh, uh, policy objective, mm -hmm. is to keep interest rates low. Mm -hmm. that's, wh that's why, that's why the, uh, the investment is but taking But the argument place. could be made there. I mean, and initially I think that the interest rates were kept low so that it would motivate people taking risks, motivate mm -hmm. investment, mm -hmm. motivate money in circulation, uh, motivate purchases, et cetera, of, of homes, investment properties, whatever. Mm -hmm. But now it seems that interest rates are being kept low to manage the U.S. debt burden. That, I, I, believe that, uh, I believe that's exactly why. Uh, it's occurring, but that's a very sophisticated point. I mean, no one, no one knows. The Fed has not come out and said, we're continuing to invest uh, $60 billion a month in order to make it cheap for the U.S. government so it could, to borrow. So it could be said then that, that the Fed doesn't believe that our debt burden is going to go down, that it's the Fed's job to maintain that low interest rate in order to finance the government. That's an interesting argument. But Sisyphus. Mm -hmm. Keeps pushing. It, 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 <laughs> The Fed cannot blink at this point mm -hmm. because if it blinks, it gets crushed. Oh, right. You know, the, the rock rolls back. What does the rock rolling back mean? It means that at that point, there's chaos because the cost of the U.S. debt goes up immediately. So it's really a chicken and egg argument as well, not to use too many analogies yeah, in yeah, this and in yeah. one not conversation. But if there is an agreement, if we do see the debt burden begin to be reduced, then in theory that could drive the economy, and in theory then the Fed wouldn't need to keep printing as much money and interest rates would go up. In theory, that's correct. On the, the other hand, if the Fed keeps interest rates low, it's supposed to motivate the economy to get bigger, therefore reducing the debt. So you don't know which one is actually in charge. 
Who's the don't know here? don't know what's in charge. Do know that the Fed is not going to change its policy probably until late 2014 at mm -hmm. the earliest. So so we're going to have stability on the on the on the debt front mm -hmm. on the on the cost of debt front mm -hmm. for and, a couple of years. And that's, here. it's interesting that there's stability there. You know, mm -hmm. in in that long-term debt front, at least you know I'm sure within some margin of some mm -hmm. sort, because on the stock side of the equation, there's not stability. I mean, you could view it as stability if you want to look at the market as being somewhat range-bound, and it has been in that range. Well, for about half a year, I guess we had a strong first, you know, first half of the year, but it's been somewhat range bound. But it seems just because of the media and because more people are paying attention to it now that that the stock market is moving daily. I mean, mm -hmm. volatile on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. uh, people aren't as much investing as much as they are just speculating mm -hmm. on what's going to happen in Congress today. It's almost like going back to you know the tech the tech boom when you had everybody day trading. I'm I'm in the financial business. Mm -hmm. I do not listen to CNBC. I do because of all the phone calls that I receive from you. It. <laughs> you have to because you, because your people listen to CNBC mm -hmm. and then they call you. Mm -hmm. I don't listen to CNBC, uh, and the and the reason very simply is I have to trust you and my financial advisors mm -hmm. to do the business that you're hired for. Uh, there's there's nothing to be gained by my second guessing that exactly. You know. On, on the short-term basis. You can't, I mean, you cannot gauge that on a day-to-day -day basis. Just like I suppose you can't gauge whether or not you should refinance your mortgage on a day-to-day -day basis. It's the overall theory of are they lower now than they were before? Is this going to be you know, more beneficial to my bottom line mm -hmm. uh, in managing my debt? So. Well, yeah, the equivalent on my end is that the person who's been processed uh, for the last 30 or 45 days and, uh, and calls and their loan is almost ready to close it three and a half percent fixed mm -hmm. and they call and they say we heard on, uh, on CNBC last night that rates had dropped to 3.375 mm -hmm. what are you gonna do? <laughs> Buy me down. I, so. <laughs> I, I'm not really certain what yeah. I'm gonna do you know it's but in other words I, I don't I don't react on a day-to-day -day basis to to your world mm -hmm. uh, I, I do take an interest in the big picture. The mm -hmm. big picture seems to me to be one of economic expansion, albeit slow, right. uh, uh, pretty consistently over the next four or five years. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how it's going to happen. So yeah. basically, in summary, you know, we look at this cliff, and everybody's talking about this cliff as sort of that immediate event that when we go over, you know, the world could end. We're going to mm -hmm. have, you know, the whatever the Mayan calendar ending mm -hmm. occurring on, on December, yeah. end of December. But that's not necessarily how it's going to feel in everybody's daily life. And so this this constant focus on the cliff is really just driving fear um, and ratings as opposed to you know really fear impacting and your life. Yeah. yeah, fear and ratings. Well, yeah. we'll be, I, hang on one second. We'll be right back actually because I want to continue this conversation, but focus it a little bit more on um, the individual client, the individual investor, and what they might be looking at right now going into this so-called clip. Super. So please join us back here in just one second. This is Money Matters. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Money Matters. I'm again joined by David Kroll of Mortgage Network and we are discussing the fiscal cliff and what will happen to your portfolio and your overall financial picture should we actually go over this so-called cliff. And you know, as we, we wanted to sort of take some of the fear away from this entire equation by talking about the fact that it's not necessarily a cliff that's going to occur on January the 1st or January the 2nd that when you wake up your financial picture will look wholly different because that's not the case. These changes will take place incrementally if any changes take place at all. Hopefully some changes will take place. So you know, let's talk about what this really means to you as an investor and also just as, as a citizen. So let's start as an investor. If we do go over this cliff is it possible that you could see a big decline in the stock market? Possibly, yes. We did see some decline following the election. Somewhat of a surprise as to how much of a decline because I think that there was the assumption that we would have uh, you know, another Obama term and that we would wind up having these discussions that we're going to, you know, that we, we are having now and will have for the remainder of the month and probably for, for the next year. Um, and typically the market is really forward looking. The stock market looks forward about six months. So it was somewhat surprising to see that decline right after Obama got into office. It sort of signaled that the market did have some concerns that we would wind up um, going over this cliff. 
That said, I, it's very unlikely that we will wind up with the kind of declines that we had back in 08, 09, or as some people are predicting, depending on which TV channels you're watching, uh, you know, of the 50% declines. It's really unlikely because Congress and the President did see what happened back you know, in August of last year, et cetera, and I think that they're going to avoid having that be the case. So you know, for investors going over this cliff for you and your 401k and your child's 529 plan, is this something that you should go and make radical changes as we approach uh, you know, the end of December? I would argue no. I think that it's you know, going to be in the typical ebb and flow of the market um, you know, that we have seen for the last several years. Granted, it is much more volatile now uh, than it was, you know, say, 10 years ago. And I think we're learning to live with this volatility. But the biggest mistakes that investors can make are really responding to fear. Fear and greed, of course, being the biggest drivers, but fear being the biggest driver. And I think that responding to that fear right now uh, you know, would be a mistake. Is it possible we'll see a decline? Absolutely. Is it possible that we'll see a rebound? Absolutely. We have historically every single time seen a rebound. The time frame of that rebound, of course, changes. Um, so you need to consider which funds you're actually using um, and putting at risk at this time. If these are going to be operating funds for your next you know, two months or uh, for a purchase that you're going to be making in the next few months, um, then that might not be something that you want to have at risk. However, your longer term funds, your retirement funds, whether you're in retirement and have another 20 years of it, or whether you're a long way from retirement and just starting to save, whether you have kids that are going to college in the next two years or the next 20 years, uh, you know, those are funds that you can leave in the market and feel comfortable that even if there is a decline when we go over this cliff, that you will see a rebound. Uh, at some point afterwards, whether it's in, within the next week, as we've seen since the election, uh, or within the next you know, year or two. So um, that's kind of bringing it back to just the grassroots from the investor's perspective. Uh, but the other thing to think about is not just your 401k and your 529 and you know, whatever other uh, you know, monies you might be investing uh, in the market at this point. The other thing to think about is just your overall financial picture. Because when you wake up on January the 2nd, you're still going to have a home and a job and a paycheck and hopefully, uh, you know, and, um, and all of that. And it, you know, there'll be slight changes that'll occur to each of those assets and liabilities, but the bottom line is the same. So I know that, you know, I talk about a lot about volatility. You're sort of my stability expert. So let's bring it back to that for a second. Yeah, I mean, that, I, I loved listening to what you just said. Uh, it, it's, uh, uh, as I view the whole human being, uh, the house is uh, not gonna evaporate. Mm -hmm. uh, as the as the effect of some right. sort of neutron bomb. Right. Um, Even if you can't deduct uh, your mortgage interest, the house is still going to be there. You're still going to have you know the enjoyment of it. Yeah. I, if sometime during the next year, uh, deductibility of interest is uh, uh, home interest is 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 compromised, is cut back, it'll be cut back for mortgages greater than four hundred and seventeen thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So ninety five percent of people won't be impacted. Right. You know, it's just. None of it is quite as dramatic as folks would 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 have us believe on television. Uh, Can I ask isn't. you a quick question, not to interrupt you? But yeah. you know, when it comes to that, if there is a reduction in the in the deductibility of mortgage interest, and it is mm -hmm. only on larger homes, because that's what most people are predicting, or on, on higher incomes or something, has there been any research done at this point on what the break point is where those individuals, those families, will stop? investing in real estate will stop buying second homes or is there sort of a, a cap on the income level you know individuals that make more than five hundred thousand dollars seven hundred thousand dollars will not be impacted just they it's not a decision factor for them um, yeah, the, the, what's the, 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 the data points the metrics are all uh, in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac literally own trillions of dollars worth of mortgages. Mm -hmm. Underlying that is incredibly detailed data. So we know a lot about the behavior of people buying $600,000 homes and less. Mm -hmm. We, don't, we don't really know anything about the behavior of people buying bigger houses. So That's really interesting. It's, it's quite interesting. The rest is hearsay. Mm -hmm. but, but that- Sorry uh, to take you off, off point there. No, <laughs> that, that's fine. But, uh, it, it brings us back to the point that that represents about 95 to 98 percent of the market mm -hmm. of in total gross dollar volume. It's a very, very stable market. The United States housing market is incredibly stable. It's coming back already. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had five or six years when we've had reduced housing units. So builders are going to be busy in spite of it being a soft economy mm -hmm. because our housing inventory is down. Mm -hmm. Hilton Head has uh, only 32 or 3,300 uh, 
uh, properties on multiple listings. Mm -hmm. At the height of the boom, there were 2,800. We're, we're really in uh, perfectly good shape. So, you know, given that homes and retirement accounts are usually families' largest assets, mm -hmm. I guess, you know, if we're getting back to sort of the, the basics of financial planning, mm -hmm. regardless of what happens with this fiscal cliff, mm -hmm. individuals really should look at, one, their mortgage, mm -hmm. um, because that, of course, you know, controls or drives, you know, a, a huge portion of, of their balance sheet. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I, I would, I guess, William, what are your thoughts on that when people come uh, in to look th at that? Three things. Uh, stop listening to the volatility in the stock market and um, respect your financial advisor. <laughs> in other words, let your financial advisor do the job. Secondly, if you have a mortgage on a piece of property and the mortgage is 4% or, or, or higher, talk to somebody like me. Okay. Thirdly, what's the big lesson from the meltdown over the last four or five years? Improving no, balance sheet. <laughs> yes, no consumer debt. We should all know mm -hmm. that consumer debt really gets us nowhere. Mm -hmm. So you, if you, if you can't pay cash for the uh, for the for the new 50-inch screen, whatever it then is, don't. then don't buy it. Mm -hmm. And also consider how much debt you have in addition to that that new 50-inch screen TV, because mm -hmm. you know you might have some cash flow right now. But you know, a question that I get, and I wish I actually got more from people, especially from a lot of younger clients and children of clients, is when they're just getting started, what is the best thing to do with my $5,000 bonus that I just got or my $2,500 bonus that I just got? What is the best thing to do with that? Because they really, you know, that, that gets to the essence of just the absolute basics of financial planning. Do you have some credit card debt? Yes, I do. Do you have any rainy day savings? No, I don't. Do you have a 401k option through your employer? Yes, I do. Okay, I mean, that sort of gives you some, some tools that you can use for what you might do with that $2,500. Yep, absolutely. Um, or or $250,000. I mean, the, the, the basics, the premise is the same. That's exactly right. My conversations with uh, millionaires are eerily similar to my conversations with uh, ordinary Joe wage Exactly, owners. because the bigger the it's income, the, the bigger the debt, typically. Yeah, so. <laughs> it's the same conversation. So, well, so those you. are the takeaways from uh, this turbulent period we've been through. Mm -hmm. uh, listen to your financial advisor, knock down your mortgage debt, and do not have any consumer debt. So yeah. focus on the basics and don't listen to all the hype, because yeah. regardless of what happens between now and January the 1st, your financial picture will hopefully you know, be improving, and, you know, but the basics of it will remain the same. Basics will remain the same. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining thank us you. again. I really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us on Money Matters today. We'll be back again tomorrow and next week and look forward to seeing you then.